I injured John Morrison so bad that Mr. Laurinaitis had to release him. I'd actually like to take this opportunity to wish John Morrison the best in all his future endeavors. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I'd actually like to take this opportunity to welcome everybody to the sound off. Guy can't talk English. He can't even say the word opportunity, just like he couldn't say WWE Universe. He botched that a couple weeks back, too. Remember that? He was like, WWE Universe. I don't know what John Laurinaitis is on, but uh, he can't speak the English language, but he's entertaining as all hell. That right there, what you heard, was my favorite part of Raw Monday Night. This, by the way, is a special weekday edition of the Solid Monster Sounds Off, episode 194, here on SEScoops.com. It is Wednesday, December 7th, 2011. The, uh... 70th anniversary of the Pearl Harbor attack on the United States of America. And uh, this episode here, I have some free time here, and uh, wanted to give an early Raw review. So this will be an abbreviated version of the Sound Off, where I uh, will talk about Monday Night Raw from this past Monday night, and then we'll save uh, the other stuff for a normal show this weekend, so you'll get a double dose of the Sound Off. Raw Monday Night was uh, an interesting show. It was a show that I noticed online a lot of people seemed to like. A lot of people seem to like Raw, at least on Facebook. Following along with people in the thread, people said, Wow, this was a great show. They're on a roll two weeks in a row, three weeks in a row. I was not a fan of this show. After all the wonderful things I had to say last week about it, Raw's evil twin reappeared this week and squandered much of that goodwill. Uh, You know, it's like a a broken record at this point how terrible a job they do of building up their pay-per-views. But, you know, even if I judge it as a standalone show... Just as a fan, objectively watching it, it fell far short of last week's effort. And uh, like I said, so many people saying what a great show this was, very entertaining, and you know what? To each their own. I'm happy you enjoyed it. Vince McMahon was not at the show. He was uh, in Afghanistan shooting footage for the Tribute to the Troop show, so Triple H was running things backstage. We learned that Mark Henry vs. John Cena will headline next week's three-hour Slammy Awards edition of Raw, which also doubles as the go-home show to the TLC pay-per-view coming up on December 18th, which continues to take shape. And uh, the fans in South Florida Monday night cared so much about that main event announcement, they gave it the what treatment. That's right. That crowd did not seem like they cared much about anything. And uh, I can't blame them. Actually, I should ask Noah if uh, it just came across that way on TV or if they were dead live because he was actually there. He uh, he did text me to tell me that there was a 41-man battle royal after the show went off the air. I believe uh, believe Dolph Ziggler won that and uh, promptly lost to CM Punk. So that problem actually that may have been the best part of the whole show, and it didn't even air on TV. Let's do the good, the bad, and the ugly. There was some good on this show. It was not all bad. The best part of the entire show, as I mentioned at the beginning, even though he cannot speak English, John Laryngitis, during the contract signing segment in the main event, butting in as The Miz was talking to wish John Morrison well in his future endeavors. And, you know, Laryngitis is, is a unique character in that I don't know that I've ever seen somebody on WWE television. I was thinking maybe Mike Adamley. Um, but even with Adamley, you know, after a while... It kind of lost a little bit of its luster. I've never seen somebody who's so goddamn terrible, but at the same time is so awesome. You know, this role is perfect for Laurinaitis. Absolutely perfect for him. But the character, you know, he himself as a performer is god-awful. Absolutely terrible. But I laughed out loud at his delivery here. It was quite great. And this was the best part of the entire show to me. The only part of the show where I actually was thoroughly entertained. We also got a new Kane resurrected promo that clearly showed him putting on his old mask and wearing his old gloves. Now, they really have no choice at this point but to bring him back with the mask. I mean, people have been clamoring for it for years, and WWE has resisted, and you know what, that's fine. If you want to say that it's an old gimmick, you know, it's in the past, he's been unmasked already for almost a decade, that's perfectly reasonable. But now you're clearly toying with the fans by teasing this, and to not deliver would just be a slap in the face. And God knows we've been slapped in the face by them before, and kicked in the crotch and spat on, but they need to either deliver or stop airing these promos. I mean, I happen to like the idea of Kane wearing his old mask, and by old, I mean the original mask from 1997 to 2001, that version. Not the half mask that he debuted, uh, I think, in 02. So... I'm putting this in the good category. You know, Kane has been stale for a while, so 
Old is new again with the Big Red Machine. It'll freshen him up a bit. By the way, we also got another It Begins promo hyping a mystery person for the January 2nd edition of Raw in Memphis, Tennessee. Now, this may be a spoiler, so for those of you who don't want to know who it is, you might want to skip ahead by about 30 seconds or so, but reports this week indicate the videos are, in fact, for Chris Jericho, who would presumably be starting a feud with CM Punk for the WWE Championship that would carry into WrestleMania. I think when I got asked this question a couple of weeks ago, I said it would either be Jericho or The Undertaker, um, and a lot of people probably said the same thing, so if it is Jericho, not a huge surprise. It'll be good if it is him. God knows they need uh, they need a little bit more depth at the top, and anybody but John Cena in the WWE title picture is good. John Cena is going to be busy with The Rock. He does not need to be in the championship picture anyway. Jericho and Punk, I think, are going to work great together. I mean, just, you know, and Jericho on Twitter now for months has been teasing the idea of a feud off and on with Punk. He's been making comments about people stealing his moves and stuff, and you know, Jericho, in real life, I've heard from people who say Jericho can be a real asshole, but I always figured when he makes comments like that online, obviously he's working people, it's part of, you know, a gimmick, or he's trying to set up a feud maybe with somebody when he comes back, you know, hey, stop stealing my move. Um, Jericho and Punk on the microphone alone is a WrestleMania-worthy feud, so if it is Y2J, uh, I'm all for it. And if so, remember, that was one of the main events I predicted for WrestleMania. I think I ran down what some of the top matches should be coming up at WrestleMania 28. Obviously, we know Rock vs. Cena. I believe Daniel Bryan and Mark Henry, obviously, is a match I've been advocating. Uh, I predicted that Jericho and Punk would have a title match. I also predicted Undertaker and Randy Orton. I'm sticking to my guns on that. I may be wrong, but uh, I still think Randy Orton ends up as Undertaker's opponent at WrestleMania. I guess we'll see. We got a WWE Network video hyping the debut of the new channel in 2012. There was a lot of news that uh, came out this week about the new network. And uh, I'm going to talk more about that on Sound Off 195 this weekend. But uh, all I'll say about this video right now, I thought it was really cool. You know, the music, the whole vibe. I thought uh, I just thought it was a really good piece of business. But if this spells the end of the WWE Classics On Demand channel in the next couple of months, I'm going to be very sad. John Cena beat Zack Ryder in a decent match. I'll put this in the good category. Cena earned himself a WWE title opportunity at the TLC pay-per-view. There was one really awkward spot towards the end in this match where Cena got sent chest first into the corner and just kind of fell into it, uh, almost like he was afraid to hit the turnbuckle. Now, either Cena really sucks or he's gun-shy about hitting the turnbuckle chest first after he tore his peck a couple of years back, which, you know, if that's the case, I can't really fault the guy for being a little gun shy. Uh, suffice to say, he's no Bret Hart when it comes to uh, taking those corner chest bumps. I did like Cena's fire and his passion after the match when Cena stormed into laryngitis' office. You know, we need to see more of that from Cena. Heading into WrestleMania, heading in to his battle with The Rock, that's the John Cena we need to see. Uh, he barged in there. He was full of piss and vinegar. I think he told David Otunga to get the hell out. He wasn't smiling or smirking and cracking corny jokes or anything like that. I like that. Um, Cena surrendered his title shot at the pay-per-view so that Zack Ryder could get another opportunity later in the show to become the number one contender for the U.S. title. So the guy is giving up his WWE Championship match, not even so that Ryder can get a U.S. title match, so that Ryder has the opportunity to potentially win and then get a U.S. title match. What a nice guy John Cena is. You know, it was cool to see them have their top star put Ryder over this way, uh, even though I still think it was dumb to have him come out at the beginning of the show begging for a title match, get one, and then just give it up. Um, and again, I talked last week about the fact that it's pathetic, it's pandering, the way that they've taken certain legends like Mick Foley and Bret Hart and Roddy Piper uh, and, and, and people over the last several months in a, in a concerted effort to get people to cheer John Cena, it never works, it never will. That's obviously why they've linked Cena up with Zack Ryder, and it's not going to work here either. If anything, uh, if you take a look at Zack Ryder's latest YouTube video, episode 42 of the Z True Long Island story, if you look at some of the comments, there's already some backlash against Ryder. People, you know, telling him Cena sucks, don't align yourself with him. Uh, it's it's going to be bad news. It's not going to help John Cena win over all the fans that hate his guts. No matter how hard they try, it's just not going to work. The other good thing on this show, speaking of Zack Ryder, was the increased TV time that he got. Um, you know, here's a guy who, who couldn't buy himself 
television time a couple of months ago. And this week, this guy was all over this show. I mean, he had to have been in no less than five segments, at least, on the entire show. Uh, so good for Zach. I'm happy for the guy. But this also leads into the bad. And there's a lot more bad than good this week. Now, while I'm happy that Zack Ryder is getting more TV exposure, getting a push, sort of, uh, with WWE, it's always one extreme or the other with this company, I've noticed. You know, either the guy gets no TV time at all, like a Drew McIntyre, who gets relegated to superstars, and even there he loses, or he gets way too much TV time. You know, this show is an example of, of Zack Ryder overkill. By the time his music hit for the umpteenth time and he came out to distract Dolph Ziggler during Ziggler's match with Sheamus, you could hear a pin drop in the arena. Maybe, again, maybe live it wasn't that bad, but on television, on my television, you could hear a pin drop in the arena. Nobody cared. Nobody cared when, when Ryder came out during that match. I mean, talk about taking something fun and just running it into the ground. I don't need to see that much of Zack Ryder on one show ever again. If they give him the Cena treatment every week, they're going to turn the fans against him. That's what they're going to end up doing. And you know what? Who knows? Maybe that's what they want. You know, maybe a nice, hearty F you to the internet fans. There are still people who believe the only reason Vince McMahon ever resurrected ECW as a brand was to kill off those annoying ECW chants. And he succeeded. So maybe he's trying to do the same thing here. I don't know. There was a certain logic back in the day, for example, when Steve Austin was the number one draw. And he was on Raw every week. You know, Austin missed very few Raw shows. But there was a method to the madness in that, you know, there was one point where Steve Austin was all over Raw. And he was still very popular. But they were running into the issue of overexposure, where Austin would come out, cut a promo at the beginning of the show, he'd be in three or four other segments. And I've heard Austin, I can't remember where, I know he's done interviews over the years, and, you know, he, he's talked about the fact at least once before, if I can remember correctly, that, you know, he, he became very sensitive to that and that you didn't want to overexpose yourself. And he would see sometimes that his name was on the run sheet for, you know, a bazillion segments, and he'd have to put the kibosh on that, you know, and say, listen, I'm, 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 you know, obviously a draw on this show, but if you're going to put me in every segment, I'm not going to mean anything to the ratings. And uh, people like that need to be safe for very specific situations. And Zack Ryder is no Steve Austin, but obviously he has his fans. He has a following. I don't need to see Zack Ryder in every other segment on Raw, okay? You did good. You put him on TV. You know, you're, you're, he's, he's got all this merchandise now. He's, he's catching on. Don't kill it dead, which I think is what they did on this show, or they came close. I also hated that entire opening segment. I know some people love these segments. They find them entertaining. You know, I, I'm also of the school, you know, many, many, many months ago, they did this segment on Raw with Miz and R-Truth and somebody else where it was like a playoff Looney Tunes. It was Randy Riley, Randy Riley. And I said then, I hated that segment. I fucking hated that segment with a passion. Uh, stuff like that just gets on my nerves. Stuff like this gets on my nerves even more. I've ragged on this before, but it bears repeating how dumb and lazy these segments are where one guy comes out asking for a title shot, then another guy comes out asking for a title shot, then another, and another. And before long, out comes the GM to make a whole bunch of matches that take up the entire show. So you mean to tell me that you went live on the air without any matches originally scheduled? How do you explain something like that? It's wrestling. Oh, I see. Well, there you go. And as if that isn't bad enough, John Cena wants a title shot. Okay, John Cena wants a WWE Championship match with CM Punk so badly that he ends up giving it up later in the show. What a waste of time this entire segment was. I hate segments like this. Miz beat Randy Orton by count out in a short match. I never thought I'd say this, but I think Randy Orton is doing too many jobs. So, they're on the outside when Wade Barrett's music plays, and he comes out to distract Randy Orton. Now, instead of just glancing at Barrett and ignoring him like a normal person, Orton is is transfixed on Wade Barrett, like, like he's in a trance. And he picks up the Miz, and he throws him back inside the ring, mind you, as the referee is counting both men. So Orton gives chase after Barrett, who runs backstage. And of course, Randy Orton is counted out 
and The Miz gets a fluke victory. Now, by virtue of this victory, Miz has earned himself a spot in the WWE Championship match at TLC. And, and Orton is shocked by this development. Why? Perhaps he, perhaps he went AWOL on his math class in elementary school, and he forgot how to count. Just like he went AWOL twice in the Marine Corps. He went to come back to the ring when Barrett came back. He attacked him from behind, left, was laughing his ass off. Barrett was, and why not? I'd laugh my ass off too. Orton looked like a complete idiot here. And this was not the last time we would have a distraction finish on this show. We had another segment on the show that I hated. Well, wasn't so much the segment, just the whole premise of it. David Otunga is backstage sipping on a cafe latte or something. I have no idea. And uh, he informs Kevin Nash that he would, in fact, be facing Triple H at the TLC pay-per-view in a ladder match. Yes, they decided to put Triple H with two torn quads and Kevin Nash, who moves slower than my grandmother, and she's been dead for 10 years, in a ladder match. Even Nash tells Otunga he don't do ladder matches. Yeah, there's a lot he doesn't do. But Otunga tells him the stipulation is that there will be a sledgehammer hanging from the ceiling. First person to grab the sledgehammer can legally use it as a weapon, so it's the nightstick match basically all over again between uh, Big Boss Man and Nails from the uh, Survivor Series in 1992. Nash pauses, and he confirms with Otunga he's intrigued. He confirms that he can use the sledgehammer and not suffer any repercussions. And this pleases Kevin Nash. Now, here's my question. Why would Kevin Nash even care about repercussions when he didn't face any after bashing Triple H's brains in with one on TV? I mean, it was so blatant. I mean, he attacked Triple H from behind with a sledgehammer. Triple H gets carted off backstage. They're putting him in an ambulance. Nash comes back, props him up against a bunch of boxes, and literally bashes him upside the head with a sledgehammer. I mean, his only punishment for that was being given a fat new contract with the WWE. All of a sudden, he cares about getting in trouble or going to jail. I'd also point out the storyline stupidity of taking a guy in Triple H, barely recovered from a supposed broken neck, and putting him in a ladder match his first night back. But I suppose you can make the argument that laryngitis has it out for Triple H, uh, and Nash is his buddy, you know, laryngitis that is, so he's stacking the deck against Triple H. Still, shouldn't this be grounds for like the board of directors we always hear about to get involved when your interim acting GM is trying to maim your COO? <laughs> I just can't believe they're doing this match at the TLC pay-per-view and not holding it off for Royal Rumble, you know? Not that I'm dying to see this match, make no mistake, we're gonna get this match like it or not, but it's gonna die a death on this show. I mean, this pay-per-view, you know, I haven't talked about it too much, but you've seen the news on SE Scoops, you've seen the news all over. The last couple of pay-per-views for WWE, the you know, Vengeance and shows like that, are doing some of the worst pay-per-view business the company has ever done. And now with this new network, you know, there's talk about shifting many, if not all, of those so-called B-level pay-per-view shows over to the new network. I mean, they may not even technically be on pay-per-view anymore. They're basically giving up on that, it would seem. Um, so you're going to take Triple H and Kevin Nash, a match that you've been building this match for months. Like I said, you don't have to like the match. It's not going to be a great match. You know, and if it is, then all credit to Triple H. But you've been building this and building this and building this. And, and to, to give this away on a pay-per-view that very few people are going to see, uh, I, I don't know about that. You know, I really don't know about that. Zack Ryder, speaking of giving stuff away on a shitty pay-per-view that few people are going to watch... Zack Ryder pinned Mark Henry on this show after John Cena ran in, delivered an attitude adjustment on Mark Henry. It was a no-DQ match, and then uh, Cena puts Ryder on top of Mark Henry for the pinfall. So just like Miz earlier in the show, here is yet another star picking up an undeserving fluke win and backdooring his way into a championship match at the pay-per-view. And I hated the fact that they pinned Mark Henry here, interference or not, I hated it. Henry already got pinned by Daniel Bryan a couple weeks back. And look at the way that Daniel Bryan was used on this show. Okay? Injured ribs or not. Jobbing to Alberto Del Rio in like two minutes. Like he's nobody. 
I mean, you couldn't put somebody else in that spot, really. You had to do Santino and Nash. You couldn't put Santino in there with Del Rio. You had to put Daniel Bryan in there. Why? There is no excuse for that. So, you know, Henry already got pinned by Daniel Bryan a couple weeks ago. Now he gets pinned again. He doesn't need to keep being pinned on TV. I hated this. This sucked. Sheamus pinned Dolph Ziggler with a bro kick. Uh, here's another distraction finish that I alluded to earlier on. On the same show, you do the same shitty finish twice. I love it. Zack Ryder's music played towards the end of this match. He walked out on stage. Of course, Dolph Ziggler allows this to distract him. And then he is kicked in the face and pinned. And my question is this. When are these morons going to realize that when someone's music plays, don't turn your back on your opponent? <laughs> anyway. I strongly disapprove of, of Ryder getting his uh, his U.S. title match. Finally, he's going to get his U.S. championship match that he has been petitioning for for weeks on end. And uh, they're going to do it on the TLC pay-per-view. I mean, you've held out this long. You've gotten people to actually care about a mid-card storyline in WWE. And you're giving the match away in a pay-per-view that almost nobody is going to watch. At least hold it off until the Rumble. I suggested last week, I didn't think they would actually do it, but, you know, maybe you find a way to hold it off until WrestleMania. You know, you, you reach a point in the next few weeks where Zack finally has the golden number that he had to reach of signatures on his petition, and he comes out, and Laronitis comes out, and, of course, he's a heel, so he'll tell, he'll come up with some bullshit excuse as to why he can't give Ryder the title match, and you can transition Ryder into something else, and... Dolph can defend the title and feud with somebody else for a month or two, and then you go back to the thing with Zack and give Zack his big win at, at, at WrestleMania or something like that. Or like I said, even Royal Rumble. I mean, if they do the title change next weekend, if, if, if Ryder wins the championship at TLC, then as somebody who was there live at Madison Square Garden as I was for the Survivor Series, they drop the ball big time by not switching the title there. Trust me, I was in the building that night. Zack Ryder was more over than The Rock. To the point where when The Rock was trying to give a heartfelt promo after the show, people chanted, we want Ryder. <laughs> so, again, if you're not going to wait, if you're not going to hold off, if you're just going to take the title off Ziggler next weekend anyway, then why the fuck didn't you do it at Survivor Series? It just it doesn't make any sense to me. Contract signing at the end of the show was every contract signing you've ever seen on a wrestling show. The only redeeming thing about it was John Laryngitis, of all people. His comment about Morrison was awesome, as I said. I think at one point he talked about how he's Mr. Personality or something. Again, the guy is terrible. As a promo, he is awful. He, 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 he talks like he has marbles in his mouth. But he plays that character so well. It's, it's, it's the weirdest dynamic. It's like... Why is this guy on my TV? But then when moments like this pop up, it's like, I'm happy. You know, for shows like this, Raws that are not as good as, as, as other weeks, I'm actually happy when, uh, when this guy comes out and makes little comments like that. You know, I thought him trying to set up the photo op uh, with all the participants in the pay-per-view main event was also pretty funny. Uh, CM Punk did some comedy. He talked about Twitter. Who cares? Uh, he beat up both challengers by himself, left them laying, and that was that. So, you know, the bulldog on Del Rio through the table was pretty cool, I will say. Uh, but I still think John Cena somehow manages to weasel his way into this match next week and uh, turn it into a four-way. So I'll call it now. I'm, I'm predicting that John Cena will be a part of this match at the pay-per-view. I just can't fathom them leaving him off the pay-per-view unless he was hurt. Um, you know, or, or like they did the storyline last year where Cena was part of the Nexus, and even then... Cena was like the guest referee for a Randy Orton Wade Barrett main event because they were so terrified to keep Cena off the pay-per-view. So my guess is he works his way into that match somehow. As far as the ugly, there really was nothing overly offensive on this show. It was just largely flat, you know? I mean, there, there was some good stuff. There was a lot of bad stuff, uh, but nothing really ugly. Um, well, except for this one guy named Noah sitting up in the mezzanine section. You know, he was pretty ugly. So that's the Raw review for this week. Like I said, I had a little bit of uh, free time tonight, so I wanted to uh, give you my thoughts instead of holding them off until this weekend. Uh, there is some other news to be uh, talked about. Just a few quick news bits here. Lillian Garcia is uh, back in WWE. 
She signed a new deal with the company to be the new ring announcer for the SmackDown brand. Starting this week, you'll see her on TV Friday night. She replaces Tony Chimmel, so poor Chimmel. Uh, Garcia, she actually left the company in uh, 2009. She got married, and she wanted to start a recording career for herself, which is obviously going so well that she decided to go back on the road full-time. So, Anyone care to take bets on how long it is before we hear Triple H making horse face jokes about her again on TV? Oh wait, that's right, they have an anti-bullying campaign now, so I'm sure there's no way they would ever do that. Also, uh, contrary to some reports that have been going around, I think I talked about it recently as well. We've had comments recently from John Cena about the same subject, and there was even an article on WWE.com in the last week or so about this very same subject. Apparently there are in fact no plans to change the design of the WWE Championship belt anytime in the near future, so... Even though it doesn't spin, people still call it the spinner belt. Well, the spinner belt is here to stay. Have some iTunes shout-outs here for some more people that left reviews. Again, if you can uh, go on iTunes and leave a review for the show and uh, let me know about it, email me to let me know about it. I will give you a shout-out right here on the podcast. i got three more to give out here this week. Big shout-out for Brass Tax Artist Producer, one of our... uh, posters on Facebook as well. iTunes shout out for The Game 619 and also a shout out for Francisco Rodriguez. So thank you to all three of you guys for leaving reviews. All right, so I'm going to use this opportunity to uh, clean out some more questions from the mailbag, which I've been meaning to do. Again, if you have questions, comments, or anything for me, email me at thesolomonster at gmail.com. That's thesolomonster at gmail.com. This question right here comes from Matt. He uh, is from Chicago, big fan of the Sound Off since episode 156. On a recent episode, you mentioned the WWE sex scandal in the 90s. This is the first I've heard of any sex scandal. Can you go into details? There were actually a lot of WWF scandals in the late 80s, early 90s. The drug scandal, obviously, that led to Vince McMahon. Uh, really, oh, he was acquitted on charges, but there was the big steroid trial in uh, 94. Uh, there were a lot of different accusations, allegations of sexual misconduct and sexual harassment. Uh, there, there was a lot of shit going down in uh, WWF around that time period. But the basic gist of the uh, the sex stuff, as uh, I said in my email back to Matt here, is that after former WWF ring announcer Murray Hodgson filed a uh, wrongful termination suit against the company, and uh, there were also serious allegations of sexual misconduct that were brought to light by Barry Orton, who was actually Randy Orton's uncle at the time. He was a young wrestler in WWF, probably about 19 or 20. Uh, And there were some some accusations levied by him and uh, a ring boy by the name of Tom Cole, who I believe actually went back to work for WWF sometime later. So even after all this, there were uh, people who said, oh, you know, can I have my old job back? And I think he was one of them. But uh, basically, Pat Patterson and Terry Garvin, who worked behind the scenes for WWF, uh, both ex-wrestlers, uh, they resigned, quote, resigned uh, their positions in 1992. Garvin never did come back to the company. Uh, Patterson did, and, and there <clears throat> are a lot of people who suggest that Patterson never actually left the company. Uh, he was still Vince McMahon's right-hand man. Even though they claimed he left, he was always there. Um, it should be noted that Hodgson was a con man and uh, was likely full of shit. But uh, it did lead a lot of other people, such as Barry O and others, to go public with stories that were likely true. So, you know, the whole thing about this is when it comes... I mean, the wrestling business can be a very sleazy business. Any industry can be sleazy. Um, You go back and and do your own research and read about and and watch videos and old news segments and clippings about all the sex stuff uh, and all the shit that went down with WWF in the early 90s. And... You will want to take five showers when you're done reading about all this stuff. You know, it's it's sad because clearly there was a lot of stuff that happened either knowingly to people like Vince McMahon, perhaps unknowingly behind their back, uh, to insinuate that everybody is innocent and nothing happened and these were all lies is not true. Uh, but then you have somebody like a Murray Hodgson who, whose credibility came into play quite a bit. Um, but that by no means uh, is an indicator that all of these accusations, all the people that came out of the woodwork were lying. In many cases, they probably were telling the truth. This all involved accusations that certain wrestlers had to sleep with these men or perform you know, oral sex on them and stuff like that uh, in order to keep their jobs, to, to work their way up the card. Let's just put it like this. Why do you think people like the Brooklyn Brawler have been able to maintain a job with this company as long as they have? Okay, need I say more? 
there was there was a WWF ring announcer named Mel Phillips, whose name you may or may not have heard of from that same late '80s, early '90s time period, who uh, was accused of having a foot fetish and and fondling the feet of young male members of the ring crew, uh, which. You know, it shocked the hell out of me on that old school Raw show last November. If you go back and watch the very beginning when they go on the air and the fireworks go off and at ringside is Michael Cole and Jerry Lawler standing at ringside wearing their vintage gear. And Michael Cole actually makes a crack about Mel Phillips. You know, before he throws it up to Justin Roberts, he says, let's go up to ring announcer Mel Phillips. I mean, Justin Roberts. And I couldn't believe that they would even mention Mel Phillips' name on television. I never thought I'd hear that name on a WWE show ever again. Uh, so, you know, he was uh, another person involved in this whole mess. You know, Vince McMahon himself had also been accused of raping a woman uh, in the backseat of his limousine, a woman named Rita Chatterton, who I believe was WWF's first female referee. Um, you know, and, and this is something that Vince's chauffeur at the time had corroborated. Um, but that case, if I remember correctly, I think it was dismissed due to lack of evidence um, or something to that effect. But So there was a lot of shit that went down back in the day. And again, I sent in the email back to Matt here that if you want to spend a good hour or two you know, getting lost in, in all of these YouTube videos, there are videos on YouTube, uh, old news reports and, and stuff like that. And uh, check your email. I sent a couple of links over to you, including... Uh, a link to the full episode of the Phil Donahue show. Phil Donahue had a very popular talk show here in the States on television back in the day. And um, there was an episode that was devoted to this very subject. And there were a ton of people up on stage all sitting next to each other, including Murray Hodgson. I, I don't remember if Tom Cole was there, but Barry O, Barry Orton was there. Vince McMahon actually was there. He was in the middle. He, Why he agreed to go on the show, I'll never know. Uh, I'll give him credit for that, but you know Vince did not come across very well on this show. Uh, Billy Graham was on there, Bruno San Martino. I remember at one point during the Donahue show, they, they cut away to the crowd very briefly, and they actually showed Elizabeth, <laughs> Macho Man's Elizabeth, uh, in the audience. I don't know why she was there. She was apparently there by herself. Uh, just very bizarre. So go check those videos out. That'll give you a, a better sense of uh, the early 90s scandals that plagued the WWF. And like I said, when you're done watching the videos and, and reading all the materials, uh, you might want to take a couple of showers. Dave writes in, everybody keeps talking about matches like Rock vs. Cena and Punk vs. Austin, but my question would be, what new guy do you think could have a high-profile match with The Undertaker? Besides somebody like a Randy Orton or a Sheamus, who could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with The Undertaker that would be considered new in WWE? If built properly... Okay, if built properly, Daniel Bryan, heel or face, could have a fantastic feud with The Undertaker. I have no doubt in my mind about that. Uh, and it, it helps that, you know, Undertaker in recent years has incorporated a lot of MMA holds and submissions uh, into his uh, repertoire. I mean, he beat Triple H at WrestleMania this year with the uh, Hell's Gate submission. Uh, and Daniel Bryan is obviously a submission specialist as well. I think the two of them could have a hell of a match. William is celebrating a birthday this Saturday, December 10th. He's actually turning 14. Was hoping to get a shout-out here on the Sound Off. Been a listener since episode 161. Happy birthday, William! His question, what the hell is the point of NXT and why has it not been canceled? Uh, well, NXT has uh, been off television here in the States now for a while, but it still airs on TV, I believe, internationally. So uh, they must make some money off of it. They've got to fill that time somehow, so... They're going to keep doing it. I know the people backstage apparently like the concept. I don't know when <laughs> this current season of NXT, which has been like the never-ending season, is actually going to end. But whenever it does, uh, I would imagine there will be a season six. Alejandro writes into the sound off. If you had a DeLorean and could travel just once in time to see any wrestling event in history, which one would it be and why? He says that uh, for him it would be WrestleMania 3 because that is when I became a wrestling fan and have been hooked ever since. And perhaps you can pose this question to the rest of your uh, podcast listeners. If they could borrow the Solo Monsters DeLorean to see an event, which one would that be? Well, I'll let you guys answer that. For me, I, I would say WrestleMania 3 is a pretty good choice as well. I, I also started watching the WWF product around that same time period. And uh, quite frankly, WrestleMania 3 is one of those shows... You know, whatever you believe, 93,000, 78,000, there were a shitload of people in that stadium that day, and WrestleMania 3 has obviously, uh, you know, its aura has just built and built and built over the years. Those two matches, just those two matches alone, Savage Steamboat 
And uh, Hogan Andre as a match was complete shit as a spectacle. I don't know that that match could ever be topped. I really don't. That you cannot replicate that dynamic. I don't think that that match had in 2011. I just don't see it. And uh, even though again Andre was terrible at that point, past his prime and in a lot of pain, uh, when Hogan picked Andre up over his head and slammed him down, and all of those people in the background are going nuts. Uh, that is probably the most replayed spot in the history of WWF, maybe even of modern day pro wrestling. To me, to be able to say that I was there live to see that would be something special. So for me, WrestleMania 3 would probably be at the top of my list. And also, ECW One Night Stand from 2005 would be another one. I've said before, I regret not going to that show. Webmaster Mike was at that show. I hate his guts. Uh, if I could go back in time, talk about having fun, real fun at a wrestling show. I watched that on television. I watched that on pay-per-view, and I had a lot of fun. I can only imagine what it would have been like to be in the Hammerstein Ballroom for that show. Matt sent me a link to a YouTube video that I wanted to pass along to everybody else. I, I just laughed my ass off at this, and I don't usually like laughing at the expense of other people when they suffer an injury and stuff, but it's a funny video. Go to YouTube, type in Mr. Owl gets asked about Kevin Nash. It's a spoof off the old... Uh, Tootsie Pop commercial. How many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Pop? And it's about Kevin Nash and, you know, torn muscles. And I, I think you'll get a kick out of it. And Adam writes into the show here. I have a question for you. You said that when Miz won Money in the Bank, you said uh, WWE might make him the first person to lose. Of course, that didn't happen. But uh, WWE being WWE, they decided to drop that idea. Well, in, in fairness... Look, every time somebody wins money in the bank, it's considered whether or not they could be the first person to lose. I'm not sure how solid the plan ever was that Miz might lose. Uh, I predicted, if I remember correctly, I'll take your word for it, that Miz might be that person, and he wasn't. So, uh, you know, good for him. But in this case, his uh, question here is, do you think that they might do that to Daniel Bryan instead, making him the first person to lose by cashing it in? and not winning his match. Also, one last thing, I went to WrestleMania last year in Arizona and I thought it was the greatest WrestleMania ever because it was my first pay-per-view event and of course, it was WrestleMania and a few people said that it actually wasn't great at all. You're right about going to a televised event and then watching it on TV, but my other question is why? Why is it going to a televised event is so much more fun than watching it on TV besides not listening to Michael Cole? Um, first on your first question, I, I really don't think Brian is going to lose. You know, I'm assuming he, he cashes it in at WrestleMania and not beforehand. Uh, if he does, I think he's going to win. I really do. And as far as the second part of your question is concerned, WrestleMania 26 will not go down as one of the better Mania shows of all time. Uh, it wasn't horrible. It was actually, yeah, it was good. But aside from the main event, there really was nothing memorable about that show. Uh, Cena vs. Batista was good. Uh, but nothing spectacular. Brett vs. Vince, we won't even mention that debacle. Uh, the reason it's so much more fun, it's very simple. It's the atmosphere. It's a full sensory experience when you go to one of these shows. I mean, think about it. When you're at home, okay, you're watching the show inside of a relatively small box. Now, I know some of you probably have like an 80-inch television, okay? Let's pretend that most people don't have a TV that big, okay? You're watching a show inside of a small box, whereas in person, you know, you're immersed in everything. The people, the pyro, the loud music, the crowd reactions, which usually come across better in person than they do on TV. And and that special feeling of just knowing that you were part of history by being at a WrestleMania show. To the people watching at home, it's another pay-per-view on TV. And, and that's it. You know, some are better than others. Uh, not every WrestleMania can be like WrestleMania 17. But that's why. So, and I've said that a lot of times before. I said if WWE or TNA... ROH. I've been to shows promoted by all three companies, okay, including TNA, and I've raved about TNA house shows. If, if a wrestling event comes to your town and you have the opportunity to go to it, especially if it's a TV event, but even if it isn't, always go. I will always recommend that people go, especially if it is a TV show, at least once. You gotta go, you gotta experience it. Aside from the commercial breaks, if it's like a Raw show, it gets a little slow. Uh, it's always gonna be more fun and more engaging than it is if you're just sitting at home on the couch watching it on TV. That's going to do it for this uh, edition of The Sound Off, episode 194, special weekday edition. If you have questions, you can email me at thesolomonster at gmail.com. 
I am uh, at this point planning on doing a normal show this weekend. I'll talk more about the uh, WWE Network and the plans for it. It's launching really soon, and apparently there's a lot of people in panic mode right now uh, in the state of Connecticut. So we'll talk more about that, probably take more of your questions. Follow me on Twitter, twitter.com slash You can friend me on Facebook as well at facebook.com slash the Sala Monster. I, I've been referring a lot lately to Facebook threads during Raw and, and uh, a lot of that kind of stuff. The only way you can be part of that, part of our little community, is to friend me. I will then approve you if I see fit to do so, and then you can be part of all the fun. So go to Facebook.com slash The Sala Monster. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes by typing in Sala Monster. It should come right up, or Sala Monster sounds off. And uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel. My username is The Sala Monster, all one word, no spaces, no hyphens, no dashes, none of that BS. And uh, as always, thank you for downloading the podcast. You guys are awesome. We're marching on to episode 200. Until then, be well, stay safe. We'll see you right back here next weekend for another edition of The Sound Off. Take it easy, guys. Let me tell you something, fella. This is Joel from Northern Ireland. I am AJ Grimaldo. And quite simply, the fastest 60 minutes on the internet. The Solar Monster sounds off on nextyscoops.com.